to Elevate Louisiana Engage podcast. Elevate Louisiana was founded earlier this year to empower women leaders throughout Louisiana by connecting and educating them on the challenges impacting our state with data-driven, nonpartisan solutions to make a better future for Louisiana. Hello, I'm your host, Julie Stokes. Today, we're recording the last podcast in a series on Louisiana's workforce and economy. Our guest today is Don Pearson, who serves as Secretary of Louisiana Economic Development. He has held this position since 2016 and previously served as LED Assistant Secretary and Senior Director of Business Development. With an executive level leadership, his duties include the implementation of domestic and international economic development programs and job retention and creation efforts for the entire state of Louisiana. He's Governor John Bell Edwards' primary representative to governmental officials, local communities, and the site selector consultants on all economic issues. Secretary Pearson possesses over three decades of economic development experience and is a certified economic development professional. Welcome, Secretary Pearson. Thanks, Julie. Great to be with you. and. Uh really applaud uh, Elevate Louisiana and your mission to uh, uh, cultivate the leadership and development of uh, uh, the women uh, that are uh, resident here in, in Louisiana and maybe probably uh, beyond our borders. And I really appreciate your leadership. You know, you've um, been in one role or another and now the top role in LED um, ever since I really started truly paying attention to everything that LED was doing, you know, some years ago. And uh, I, I feel like, you know, we're really succeeding under your leadership and really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Well, I know that um, one of the topics that's really important to you and LED is creating greater economic opportunity for Louisiana's people. You know, and the best way to accomplish that's usually through job creation and bringing better jobs to our people. What can you tell us about the current picture for jobs right here in Louisiana? Well, it's uh, uh, of course a very challenging time due to the pandemic, uh, but even with that backdrop, we've had a tremendous amount of success this year. Um, it, it certainly has been uh, uh, a great uh, time uh, in the history of Louisiana as we were uh, with a very robust economy in, uh, in 2019, just prior to this pandemic, the state was uh, uh, close to 2 million uh, people employed. Uh, and some of the metrics we watch, we watch uh, the gross domestic product for the state. Uh, we wanna see as many people employed uh, as possible. And then uh, not just at low wages, uh, watching uh, the, the personal income uh, associated with the workforce and the, and the jobs that we have rise uh, so uh, to, to accomplish those things, uh, we've got to work on a number of fronts. We work on a, uh, a business attraction, trying to recruit new uh, business and industry into the state. Uh, we try to make sure, and I'd say maybe 60% of our effort is focused on taking care of the industry that we have here. Uh, certainly, it is, uh, it's a lot easier to grow jobs uh, with existing companies uh, than to find the new ones that are uh, uh, making a capital investment and, and making some major changes. Uh, beyond that, uh, the importance, uh, of course, with Louisiana being such a, uh, a gateway to the global economy, uh, all the things that we do internationally uh, are more impactful, I think, in, in Louisiana than in some other states, again, uh, because of our ports and, uh, and the way that we can conduct global commerce. And then finally, the component, I think, that was uh, undervalued, but that we put a lot of uh, work uh, into over the last five years is our small business sector of the economy. And uh, so trying to manage uh, basically those four key elements and then trying to do that uh, across our state in uh, essentially eight metro uh, regions uh, that all are sort of like your kids. Uh, there's the one that's uh, doing all their homework and making A's on the report card. And then there's some that are having a tougher time. And uh, so we, we don't have a one size fits all. Uh, we try to move into those communities and uh, uh, dial into their strengths and, uh, and help make progress there. So overall, this, uh, the pandemic has been uh, terribly impactful. 
to our hospitality industry, uh, the restaurants, hotels, and attractions in uh, the particularly greater New Orleans area. But but tourism is strong for uh, Shreveport Bossier. Uh, tourism uh, through uh, gaming and other activities in, in the Lake Charles region uh, are all uh, important. And uh, again, uh, nationally, internationally, uh, those sectors are, are struggling uh, along with uh, airlines and some other areas uh, as well. So uh, we would be doing a lot better once the uh, cruise ships start cruising and the planes start flying. And I guess we can see that light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine that's being rolled out presently and uh, with the promise that it has. And uh, I think the medical experts in our state are saying uh, to, to manage our expectations for uh, maybe this fall uh, that uh, we'll begin to have what uh, we used to call normal. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, what would you say overall? Uh, and, and I guess, would there be any particular number of jobs or economic impact that COVID's had on these sectors? Like, you know, when you look at tourism and travel, um, you know, the Port of New Orleans isn't really receiving any more, um, you know, cruises aren't going in and out of there every day. The hotel industry has got to be struggling. And I know trying to make money in whatever way they can, I see them hosting groups of, you know, people helping out with different projects and all, and not necessarily the kind of stuff they used to do with conventions. So, um, you know, how big has that impact been? Well, it's certainly significant. Uh, you're probably talking about 100,000 uh, jobs if you added up the various markets that we've touched on. And um, uh, some people obviously have been able to uh, pivot uh, into other positions. Um, but uh, really uh, a strength for Louisiana. Tourism uh, as an overall industry here has always been a, such an important part of our economy. Uh, that belongs to uh, the Lieutenant Governor, but uh, uh, certainly the, uh, the impacts are small business and, and that's where we overlap. And uh, for those struggling companies to be able to connect them to the uh, federally uh, allocated resources uh, through the SBA, uh, the Payroll Protection Program, and the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program uh, ha has been a big activity for us. And so all of those uh, small companies that are having to release workers uh, that are struggling to keep the doors open, uh, we've been trying to uh, do all the things that we can to, uh, to help them. One of those things is to encourage them to pivot into e-commerce. Uh, maybe it wasn't so important uh, previously, but now your restaurant or your other type of business needs to have an online presence, needs to have a way to uh, do the uh, financial transactions uh, uh, and, and setups. And so uh, we've, we've made that as an, uh, an available uh, opportunity. Uh, but it's been those kinds of things that uh, we've really tried to uh, also pivot from an LED perspective. Those things uh, were new to us. But uh, everybody's got to be innovative right now and uh, together work through this. Uh, and that's good points, you know, because even though as a family or even cer certainly with friends and, you know, different groups that you'd always go to lunches, um, you know, we're certainly doing our fair share of ordering from uh, online food ordering apps, you know, DoorDash, Grubhub, and our own waiter, which is right here in Louisiana. Um, we're started right here in Louisiana. So um, yeah, I agree. I think the pivot is, is a really important uh, facet of what companies can do to kind of keep the ship sailing in the right direction. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, looking forward to 2021, what could you tell us about the kind of companies that are choosing Louisiana for investment coming up or expansion? Um, you know, I guess, what are the challenges in bringing them here? Um, what's going on on that front? Yeah, so, um, and, and I'll give a little background as I, as I ease into that, but uh, that's part of what uh, we, we try to do if we think of this as a, uh, maybe a pyramid of sorts, uh, our foundation being in uh, the strengths that have been uh, along a part of the Louisiana economy, our agriculture, uh, the logistics represented through our ports and our six class one railroads, uh, the forestry industry and, and paper production and the things that uh, uh, we, we've had strength in. And we're starting to see 
uh, a return of uh, uh, some great uh, forestry kinds of a related uh, dimensional lumber and uh, wood pellet uh, type operations uh, based on uh, uh, the rich forest resources that we have. But we also want to have, uh, and, and oil and gas is certainly a, a foundational uh, industry for us, but we know that that is uh, under certain pressures uh, globally. Uh, sad to see this uh, announcement about the Shell refinery closing, uh, but it's, it's a very strong indicator that uh, we want to be uh, mindful uh, to not just rest on our laurels, so to speak, with our foundational industries and the kinds of areas that we've been successful in the past, but also at the same time be integrating that over the horizon look. And we've been at that for some time too. We've been uh, uh, cultivating the uh, IT and code writing and uh, digital transformation industry in our state. I'm really pleased to say that you know, in, in Baton Rouge, uh, quite evident to us that we have IBM and in, in New Orleans DXC, but uh, in Lafayette, there's a CGI in Shreveport, Bossier. Uh, now it's uh, General Dynamics IT, GDIT up there. Certainly, uh, CenturyTel and uh, uh, IBM are uh, anchors there in, in the Monroe area. So, uh, looking at uh, the growth potential uh, that in, continues to be important in IT sector. Uh, beyond that, advanced manufacturing, uh, oceaneering, doing uh, subsea inspection vehicles, uh, Boeing building the space launch system over at Mishu, and Lockheed Martin there right with them, uh, putting the uh, Orion space capsule together. Uh, Stellar Fittings does uh, some amazing work with uh, advanced manufacturing. So uh, we want to See the cultivation of those kinds of advanced manufacturing jobs. We're doing a lot in water management. We're going to be global leaders, and perhaps to some degree, we already are in water management. And while that sounds like, gee, well, what's that? Uh, think about the fact that the CPRA has a billion dollars a year that they're spending on projects right now. So uh, uh, certainly, uh, water management fits into the one of those categories uh, that, that we're trying to see. Uh, how we can harness as much uh, uh, creation of new uh, engineering and uh, all kinds of, of powerful jobs that uh, can be powered by those kinds of dollars that are now available in those sectors. So uh, we've got our foundation, we've got our eye on uh, aviation, aerospace, uh, life sciences, and, uh, and these other areas. Uh, so we're going to see continued progress uh, in those lanes as well. No, that, that's really exciting stuff. And I mean, you know, when I think about the water management, uh, and I remember right after Hurricane Katrina, everybody taking trips to the Netherlands to go find out what did you guys do there? Like, why did it work so well there? And what were their secrets? And, you know, I think we have been able to bring a lot of that kind of technology and that thinking back home to Louisiana. So certainly to become part of the, the, the thought leadership in that area around the world, I think you're right dead on that that's key. And with all the work we're doing, sudden, certainly that seems like that should be a really big asset. You know, I always say you have to turn your messes into your ministry. <laughs> so well, I think a, that's a good one. It's a great success story. And uh, those relationships that were established with the Dutch, who were and, and are uh, been the, the pioneers in trying to control uh, water management, uh, they live 40 feet below sea level, not just uh, three or four uh, yards or so, uh, like New Orleans may. But uh, importantly, uh, Del Taris, one of their largest engineering companies, uh, because of relationships that were built, uh, is now also a, uh, an anchor tenant at our water campus. So uh, those relationships continue, a lot of work being accomplished in that area. And there's an exciting project out there that uh, was announced by the governor in July that's uh, really gaining in momentum that we call smart port. And uh, what that has to do with is establishing a uh, IT backbone that uh, integrates uh, the major ports that we have along the Mississippi River uh, in, in new ways, uh, the development of some software uh, that'll act kind of like uh, Waze does when you drive in your car and you wanna know where the bridge is out or the traffic's backed up on the interstate or what have you. Uh, collecting data from tugboats out there, uh, 
that's what Waze does. It's collecting data from your smartphone in your car uh, and integrating that in the cloud, uh, bringing about the artificial intelligence uh, elements of that and looking for or where the uh, depth of the river is changing. And by monitoring that through this tugboat traffic that's happening uh, with or without the, the sensor that's on that, uh, collecting all that data and making it usable is something that the water campus is focused on. We're in a partnership with the Port of New Orleans. And uh, I think our project's about to get a lot bigger and that uh, we'll have some linkages with the Port of South Louisiana and the Baton Rouge Port, and eventually to our inland ports uh, across the state as well bringing not only this state-of-the-art, what's the depth, uh, which that might not sound too sexy on the surface, but uh, if your ship is trapped and you have to send another vessel to unload cargo so that it gets lighter, so that it has the, the depth that, that it needs to, to continue to move on the river, it is a big deal. Uh, but we'll be able to integrate weather into this when storms are coming and then we know that uh, the, the, the river depths are changing constantly with how much rain that they're having up in the Midwest or something. Uh, so that, and then uh, beyond that, to be able to integrate uh, which vessels are headed towards us in the, in the Gulf, uh, the, the kinds of cargoes and logistics that uh, can easily be moved uh, over to the rail and through containers. All of this is gonna put uh, Louisiana at the forefront of, uh, with, with a smart port program. And when I first heard of all this, I said, surely they're doing this in Long Beach or New York or somewhere else. No, we're pioneering this in Louisiana and, uh, and we're driving it forward uh, at, a, at a nice pace. Well, Sorry, gosh, I got that, off on the track on that, but I love that project. Love it integrates our strengths in IT, our strengths mm -hmm. in logistics. Uh, the ports are so important to us and uh, I just get riled up. It's an exciting new uh, technology we're bringing to the table. No, well, that, that is amazing stuff. And I, I know from visiting Port Bouchon, I mean, just what a cool, I mean, a cool area. I mean, and to go into there and learn about all the business and international business that's done through that port and all the oil and gas industry and how it all fits together and how Louisiana is really perfectly positioned, you know, at the mouth of the Mississippi and at the top of the Gulf of Mexico within all the pipelines and within the, the, the shipping channels, the pipeline channels. Um, we're just positioned to really make big things happen. And that's always been one of my arguments, you know, it's like Louisiana really has the potential to be a shining star because of those kind of industries. Um, I know one of the things that gets talked about in those circles with ports is depth so that ships are gaining and, and, and becoming deeper into the, into the waterways. So sometimes is it like 52 feet that they need to have dredge to get boats back and yeah, forth? You're correct. It's 50 yeah. feet is sort of a, a gold standard. Mm -hmm. And what an exciting time. We know that uh, the Mississippi River has really cradled all the development in, uh, in Louisiana dating back to our earliest days. But there's some new things, and the new things are that the completion of uh, $14 billion of flood protection around the greater New Orleans area, the uh, acquisition by the Port of New Orleans of the uh, public belt rail, uh, so now that it, it doesn't have to uh, produce a profit for the uh, city of uh, New Orleans or others, that it's controlled by the port to uh, move traffic across these six class one rails in a... Uh, more effective uh, way. And then recently, to your point, the signing of uh, agreements with the Corps of Engineers to dredge the Mississippi River to 50 feet from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Baton Rouge. Uh, it, it is, it's going to uh, really, uh, those three things combined, uh, build a, a whole new set of opportunities for us. And that's happening while these larger ships are coming through the Panama Canal with more cargo and more containers. And so uh, again, uh, this lower Mississippi River channel uh, with a smart port IT backbone added to it uh, is becoming a, a, an improved world-class asset. That's incredible. Uh, and it really is one of the most exciting areas. Another one uh, that you had kind of touched on, and especially when we talk about the IT um, dynamics of running ports. It, it reminded me of a silicone bayou and 
you know, all the talk and all the, you know, concentration there was around digital media and our research and development and, you know, all the different digital arts that were occurring in, in the New Orleans area specifically, but really all around the state. Um, what's the update on that? Well, it's uh, been a great investment uh, for the state to actually uh, try to cultivate that industry. If you go back eight or 10 years, we had uh, very little uh, to offer uh, in that sector. But as we've added uh, these major corporations uh, through the leadership of the legislature and the governor, uh, we've also invested heavily into all of our campuses and, uh, and, and technical colleges uh, across the state uh, to marry this. And this is a, something that I would really uh, brag about uh, for uh, the state of Louisiana. Uh, we have what I consider to be the best uh, economic development and education, higher education uh, partnerships that there are out there. Uh, we were uh, on the LSU Shreveport campus with a, uh, a million dollar match to a $2 million uh, LSU program to uh, uh, build up a, a $3 million computer lab uh, there. Uh, but we're over at Southeastern, we're at UNO, we're at Grambling, we're at Southern, we're uh, all these uh, schools uh, all have far more robust uh, IT programs now, and we're trying not to just have sort of your uh, generic IT program, but we're going to uh, these major employers, the IBM, DXC, GDIT, CGI, man, there's a lot of alphabet soup out there, uh, <laughs> to make sure that uh, we are uh, teaching uh, the code writing skills or the uh, artificial intelligence uh, languages that, that allow these graduates or these certificate holders to walk right across the street from the university and go right to work in high paying jobs. And uh, uh, an amazing story there, a great partnership with our uh, four year universities and the uh, uh, LCTCS, the Louisiana Technical College uh, system as well. Uh, so a seamless partnership in the background that's the, the, the pipeline for a, a great IT workforce. And, and IT is not just for these uh, IT companies. I mean, it, it's touching all our manufacturing operations, our refineries. Uh, you know it from uh, everything from going to uh, McDonald's and ordering off, uh, uh, off the board uh, with a touch screen. Uh, IT will continue uh, to be a, a driving force and a force of change. And so uh, all of those industries uh, need these kind of IT professionals. Yeah, well, and uh, if anything, I would think COVID-19 has really hastened that, um, you know, just with all these virtual meetings <laughs> like we're doing right now. I mean, I would think that this is gonna push technology even into being more necessary. Like you can't operate without a digital presence and you can't operate without remote remote abilities. Um, so, and you know, I'm glad that you kind of touched on the educational work to make sure that our workforce is there to meet our economic development needs, because those two things are so married up. Um, you can't have, you can't have the industry without the workforce and you can't, you, you don't want to train workforce if there's nowhere for them to go work. Um, and it makes me think, um, what do you need? Um, what do we need as a state to be able to go after new industries and create you know, what, what really needs to be a brighter future right here for, for that next generation of Louisianans? Well, we've got a number of great things in place. Uh, so I know it's going to be a big challenge for the legislature to face some uh, uh, very difficult financial decisions that are right around the corner because of the, the way our economies have been impacted. We just won't have the revenues that we need to keep all the status quo in place. There's going to have to be some cuts. Uh, but, but certainly as we uh, judiciously make those uh, adjustments, uh, certainly we need to continue to honor um, uh, certainly uh, education in all the ways that we can, uh, early childhood education being uh, critically important as well. Um, but along with this, uh, certainly broadband, and we're seeing a, a lot of uh, broadband um, initiatives right now. Uh, fortunately, we're getting a lot of our federal assistance there. But uh, certainly the pandemic has shown 
uh, that our rural areas can really struggle. Um, and, I, and I would submit to you there are urban areas that also can be uh, uh, digital deserts. And uh, with the uh, renewed importance of e-commerce, of distance learning, and also the, the savings associated with telemedicine uh, that are going to develop in the coming years, uh, we need to make sure that that infrastructure uh, that everybody has, uh, not necessarily broadband, but, but internet access in a robust manner, however they may uh, achieve that. And part of that, a large part of that is, is maybe uh, the, the hardware associated with all that. But there's also some uh, socialization that, that needs to take place because uh, the elderly that need the uh, telemedicine the most uh, may not be conversant with that iPad or that other uh, uh, laptop or however this uh, might be achieved. So uh, uh, lifelong learning, it's never gonna leave any of us. We're gonna continue to uh, adapt to new technologies. But, uh, but those are some of the things that I think are, are important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what about like what kind of economic uh, development deals are you working on now that you can talk about? Like, are there any deals in the works that we're trying to or in industries that we're trying to develop, particularly in the near future? Well, there's a lot of um, a, a very robust pipeline uh, that we're experiencing right now. Um, uh, the good news, I think, is it's uh, sort of in a uh, broad cross-section of, of different disciplines. Uh, aviation and aerospace is a uh, target for us. Uh, granted, the planes aren't flying right now and, uh, and the helicopters are, are largely parked as well, uh, but there's still some great opportunities that'll be uh, around those industries as they uh, come back immediately after the uh, pandemic and there'll be a, a, a great deal of pent-up demand. So uh, we're staying uh, active uh, in, in those corridors. Uh, we've seen a lot of interest in our state uh, from uh, Amazon, uh, a recent announcement on the uh, North Shore of one uh, called Medline. And uh, these are, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll say fulfillment centers. Uh, sure, we like to have all kinds of investment and uh, distribution centers are, uh, are welcome, but distribution centers typically don't employ a lot of people. But these fulfillment centers uh, do. Uh, where they uh, sort a lot of products. We know, and you, your audience knows very well, uh, what uh, an Amazon order might look like and how they've got to pull together a, a number of different items and then uh, get it all shipped out. Uh, for a company like Medline, they are the fulfillment for uh, healthcare systems. So uh, all the supplies that doctors, uh, nurses need on a daily basis, whether it's PPE or uh, the specific toolkits for uh, various types of surgeries, say somebody had to have their wrist operated on or something, there are certain types of tools that would be appropriate for that. And so the entire kit comes to them and uh, they've gotta be maintained in a sterile environment and uh, they've gotta be delivered very carefully. Uh, so uh, Medline, a very uh, welcome new addition uh, over in Tangipahoa Parish. But there's some similar types of operations uh, that we're talking to, uh, with right now. And I can't leave out uh, just how devastated Southwest Louisiana is and how much uh, effort that we're going to have to continue to uh, pay attention there to uh, develop and uh, help uh, a whole array of businesses kind of get back on their feet and get that market reestablished. Chenault Airfield over there, uh, again, at some of those great aviation jobs that I'm talking about, but uh, a lot of devastation on that campus, on the Sowella campus. Uh, just, just a lot of work to be done and uh, we'll continue to focus our resources, our state resources and all the federal resources that we can gather uh, to help get Southwest Louisiana uh, back to where they need to be. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, what's LED's um, big legislative agenda or what are you looking to accomplish in the 2021 regular session? Um, we typically, uh, are not uh, front and center um, uh, relative to legislative packages. Uh, again, we started off uh, with the Edwards administration with a $2 billion deficit. Uh, we were able to work through that and, and get to a very uh, point of having a robust economy at the uh, uh, closeout of, of, of 2019. Uh, now the world's a completely different place uh, coming out of the pandemic. 
so uh, our incentive programs are going to be important. Our workforce, uh, the Fast Start program, uh, 11 years running best in the nation. And that's not like uh, shooting a, at an archery target that's stationary and stays the same. We've had to pivot, grow, uh, adapt, and, uh, and do a lot of things to be best in the nation. But that's important to us, and I hope we don't see uh, cuts there. So I think it's going to be more on, uh, on, on demonstrating the value that LED brings to the citizens of our state uh, by growing our small businesses, by recruiting new business in, uh, by having a strong working relationships uh, with our ports and international commerce and the, and the existing industry that we have in our state, helping them grow and, and solve problems. Uh, growing the pie, uh, I think as a former legislator, you know this very well, uh, is uh, the optimal solution for everybody. It grows the state, it grows income, it grows our, our gross domestic product. And uh, we go to work every day to figure out uh, those equations. We've had a great deal of success with it. And uh, we're, we're just hopeful that uh, we can do the best job possible. And, and that does take resources and, uh, and the people and the, and the, uh, to the teamwork with uh, other organizations across the state. We're a relatively small department, uh, about 100 people, uh, trying to cover 64 parishes, eight regions, and uh, can only do so by working closely with the uh, elected officials, the, the mayors, the reps, the senators, and uh, also with uh, economic development uh, organizations and uh, chambers of commerce uh, in those regions, the universities in those regions um, together uh, so that there's a well-coordinated and executed uh, uh, plan around what the specific needs are, what the strengths are for uh, each of the eight regions in our state. Yeah. Well, one of the big responsibilities that you took on this year, and, and largely because of COVID, uh, was that you were co-chair of the Resilient Louisiana Commission. And what did you learn from that experience? And what lessons can the commission teach us for how to make our state more resilient and, you know, more resistant to threats like COVID-19 and resilient from hurricanes and other national or natural disasters in our future? Well, that's a great topic and a great question. Uh, it has about a 45 minute answer, uh, <laughs> which we may not have time for today. I'll be happy to come back. But, but to just sort of uh, give the thumbnail sketch of it, uh, it it's been a very powerful uh, engagement. Uh, it starts with 15 commissioners that uh, a few of them are uh, leaders in, the, in government. Uh, Jay Darden with the Division of Administration and Kimberly Robinson with the, uh, the, the revenues. Uh, Ava Dashwa with the Workforce Commission, but also uh, business leaders, uh, PAR, uh, Committee of 100, uh, Cable, all put uh, representation into this and uh, also from uh, the, the elected officials, uh, the Senate and the, and the House. So uh, a real uh, a broad range of, of individuals participating. Uh, we looked at 15 task force uh, all different kinds of uh, impacts of our economy in, uh, in all these different areas. Uh, those groups uh, formed up with 10 or 12 or more people on the task force. Uh, so by the time it was all said and done, we had 400 people working on this. Uh, it was an amazing time because early on in the pandemic, uh, a lot of people were at home. Uh, we discovered Zoom <laughs> and uh, that was a powerful tool. So we got a lot of great participation uh, this also allows uh, for public participation as well. Uh, we came with the initial recommendations to the governor to uh, guide some of the things that had to be done in the uh, emergency stages early on, and then uh, more recently issued our larger report for uh, long-term uh, areas of, of uh, building resilience in our state. And it, those things do have to do with our tax structure, with our infrastructure, uh, with broadband, uh, with healthcare systems. Uh, and, and so there's a full report on that uh, that's available at opportunitylouisiana.com, the LED website. Uh, go to uh, the Louisiana Resilient uh, Commission's uh, microsite there. And uh, we think that that document uh, has guidance for citizens, for small businesses, for elected mayors and, and parish presidents, for uh, members in the, in the House and the Senate, and, and really some guidance for our congressional uh, delegations about 
uh, various things that uh, are important to all of us. So it's not really uh, incumbent on any one specific stakeholder uh, to try to uh, implement uh, the recommendations uh, in that document, but uh, a lot of great thought has gone into um, uh, pushing forward the recommendations that are there. And, and really there's some endorsement there of some things like reset uh, that mm -hmm. uh, in early childhood education, et cetera, uh, that we didn't have to go reinvent those wheels. So there's a, a page in the document that just says, you know, you, you really should take a look at uh, execution of these uh, recommended uh, pathways. So uh, a very robust document now, uh, one that can uh, actually serve as a strategic plan on how to make the state, as you said, not necessarily stronger, but uh, certainly less vulnerable. And uh, this kind of pandemic that's taken us down, that's given such a, a big hit to our economy, uh, how do we fortify ourselves? Uh, but, but again, uh, because of the, the broad approach to this, uh, looking at our, our fiscal uh, nature, the, the, again, the infrastructure, all the key elements that drives our economy uh, as being important workforce uh, in there, um, childcare in there, et cetera. So uh, good stuff, uh, a lot to unpack. Yeah, no doubt. I was wondering, you know, if, because going into this session, it's going to be a fiscal session, one of the few times to do any sort of tax reform. Um, and when you look back to the HCR 11 task force that you, you know, you, you probably mentioned in there and you look back to, uh, I recall when the tax foundation did an assessment of Louisiana's tax tax structure for the committee of 100. And if there was anything that you could get done in Louisiana's tax structure to help with economic development, what would that be? Well, I think we would like to uh, lower the sales tax burden. Uh, we would like to um, eliminate the income tax, but these things, you know, if you're gonna take something off the table, you really can't. You have to shift that to another place on the table. And so uh, trying to determine uh, how you would do that with property tax millages or, uh, I, I don't know. It, uh, the, the, the answers are really uh, that HCR 11 uh, task force that was put together by the legislature uh, was staffed by uh, some really talented people. Uh, the answer is really there, uh, but it's, it's just really challenging um, in the execution which probably means, uh, you know, back to that quilted analogy, uh, back to a, a phased uh, set of, of goals uh, that, that are um, uh, committed to in a, in a sort of a, a binding way so that uh, we can move the needle over time. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how things will work out this session. As we usually are, it's always um, interesting when, when when the legislature gets in session and we get to see all the different ideas that get bantered about. But um, it's probably about all the time we have for today. Uh, I would really like to thank you, uh, Secretary Pearson, for joining us um, very much. Uh, you will also be joining us for our symposium that will take place, um, well, they'll take place from January 28th to February 12th. I think your part will be on February 5th um, when we cover workforce and economy. And we'll be joined by all of the guests that were with us on the other video cast in this series. Uh, visit our website uh, for more details at www.elevatela.org. Remember that that's Elevate with two L's or E-L-L-E-B-A-T-E-L-A.org. And for those of you who are listening, if you're interested in joining Elevate Louisiana, you can also visit our website there. Uh, you may listen to all of Elevate's Engage interviews on all platforms where you find your podcasts also. If you just can't bear the idea of sitting in front of your screen for another moment, which happens to me sometimes, just tune in wherever you get your podcasts. And finally, don't forget to like Elevate Louisiana on all your social media platforms. And don't forget to share this video cast or podcast on your page if you found it interesting. I'm your host, Julie Stokes, and we'll see you next time.